and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on the show talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. This podcast is sponsored by Syncback Pro, the professional photographer's tool to keep your images safe. How safe are your photographs? Or to put it this way, how would you feel if you permanently lost some or even all of them? The fact is, there are very real risks in storing your digital images on a hard drive, even if they're backed up to an external device. There's ransomware, hardware failure, file corruption, virus infection, and even accidental deletion or destruction. Syncback Pro makes this problem go away permanently. Syncback Pro is the professional photographer's tool to back up photographs, images, documents, and data files. Once set up, it keeps your files safe, quietly and reliably in the background. So if problems occur or disaster strikes, you'll have nothing to worry about. Your photographs will be safe. Which is why it's also the backup solution that I use myself for my own photographs. Take advantage of an exclusive 25% discount today by going to www.backup.sg. The software will never expire, meaning your photographs are safe forever. That's www.backup.sg. Give your photographs the protection they deserve. And now, on with the show. As a lover of the colour yellow, a connoisseur of coffee, an adventurer on road trips and a devoted companion to her 11-year-old whippet, Ollie, Sarah Lindsay finds joy in life's simple pleasures, yet photography is her true passion, a dream come true. With over 12 years of professional experience, photography has profoundly transformed her life. She dedicated every spare moment to mastering the art, pursuing formal education in professional photography and earning her diploma. It has been a rewarding journey guiding her into landscape and self-portrait photography, as well as the realm of NFT art. Known for her signature yellow dress, she weaves stories that evoke profound emotions and foster deep connections with viewers. Through photo tours and workshops, she guides and educates others, helping them unlock their creative potential. In the realm of fine art, she continually seeks personal growth on this extraordinary journey. We discuss how the yellow dress came about, her travels around the world in pursuit of amazing landscapes, the importance of purpose, communication and storytelling in her photography, along with a lot more. I hope you enjoy the show. G'day, Sarah. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How's your day going? It's going pretty good. It's still a little bit early, so just starting the day, but it is beautiful and sunny here. I'm currently in London, so enjoying all the rainy and sunny weather <laughs> that comes throughout the day. Yeah, the, the the four seasons you get in one day in in London. <laughs> yeah, but it's beautiful because it's spring right now, so it, all the flowers are out, so it's just gorgeous. Nice. It's uh, a little bit cooler here. We're heading into autumn. Plenty of clear skies at the moment, and it's it's getting what we call cold. Yeah. Because yeah, you're in Australia. Degrees. Yeah, we're, I'm in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've spent a lot of time. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's not cold for me because I'm from no, Canada, I but I spent a lot of time in Australia, so I, I love it there. Fantastic. We might talk about that a little bit later. Why don't you tell people who you are, people that may not have come across your YouTube channel or any of your work online. It would surprise me if there hasn't been some exposure to it. Oh, uh, I'm sure there's lots of people that don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them who you are and why you do what you do. I am Sarah Lindsay. I am a Canadian photographer. I live in a very beautiful place called Banff, which I'm sure most of the world knows. It's quite well known in the Canadian Rockies. And I have been a photographer, a landscape photographer for about 13 years now. But I also do self-portrait photography that came a little bit later on in the journey. And it's really heavily focused around the yellow dress that I wear quite a bit in all of my self portraits. <laughs> so that's based the yellow dress has basically become the brand and the face of everything that I do. And now I do both of them actually at the same time, landscape photography and the self portrait photography. I've basically have blended the two together and created the yellow dress saga. Fantastic. So take us back to the beginning. Where did it start for you? How did landscape photography become a thing for Sarah? 
I was quite young when I first discovered photography, maybe 22 or 23, those early years of the 20s. And it actually started with Photoshop. It didn't start with photography. I was on a date with a fella who is a photographer and he brought me back to his house because he wanted to show me like what he does. He, at the time he was making he would take images and then he would bring them into Photoshop and make, he was really into death metal. So he would okay. make like, yeah, it was cool. He was a really cool guy. He would make, he loved making album covers for bands. Yep. So that was like, I looking back now, I can see that was his creative mindful space. So I just loved watching the pro, like he showed me how he does everything and I had never seen Photoshop before. So I just loved the process of how he would create like layers and textures and just create something in that program. So I asked him, so I wanted to do that, not album covers, but I just wanted to play in Photoshop. Oh, so sure. I asked him to give me the program. So he illegally downloaded the program for me. We won't right, right, tell Adobe. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so long ago. I don't even remember how you got Photoshop back in the day, but so he got put the program on my computer for me. And then I was like, okay, what do I do? I just took his lead by working on images. So I was like, all right, I need to go out and take some photos and put this in, put these into Photoshop. So I found my parents had the little really tiny old point and shoot at the mm -hmm. time. So I took, I used that point and shoot for so long. So I grabbed that and I just went out and started taking photos of usually like flowers and bees and jewelry. I would photograph jewelry okay. because I really liked, I really loved the bokeh effect and where I would get like the inspiration from to start that because the fellow also showed me a site that was full of art and photography. It was, I'm not sure if many people will remember this, but it's called Deviant Art. Are you, so are you I, used to be a deviant? Yeah, yeah. deviant art. That's like just I think, the original. I think my account's still live. It hasn't had that yeah. posted to Mine is too. It, it reminds me of MySpace, but for artists. And yeah. Anyways, I just, I would always see the images. Like there would be people that would just take photographs of like hedgehogs in like little teacups. It was so sure. cute. Sure. And then I just, my mind, that was it for me. My mind just exploded into creativity. But for a long time, I was photographing like everything that I would read in magazines or online, I was like, I want to try that. I want to try that. So I did everything, people, landscapes, again, jewelry, just creating little things and then putting it together in Photoshop. So I had quite a vast portfolio in the first year, but I never shared it with anyone. Never, ever. I didn't show people what I was doing. I just loved creating. And then finally, I posted a few photos on Facebook because Facebook was raging back in the day. Yep, yep. So I posted a few photos there and it's usually your family members that will see it. And then they just started encouraging me. And I remember I was reading a magazine. Uh, my parents would get me a couple of photography magazines here and there. And I was reading this one and I saw this picture of Lake Louise which is in Canada, very really close to where I live now. But back then I had never been into the Canadian Rockies and I just fell in love. And I, that photo pretty much started my landscape photography journey. I knew I was going to go to that location and take a very similar photo. And that was it. Then I started getting into star trails and wanting to experiment with the just cool little techniques. And cool. I have not stopped since. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. So when I talk to a lot of photographers, they tend to say they liked hiking and so they were recording what they were seeing. And there's, for me, that sort of split between being a record or recording type ph photographer versus yeah. an artistic photographer. Sounds yeah. like that was flipped around a little bit for you. It was more the art yes. that came yep. first and then the photography flowed on from there. Yes. So I, I do hike now, obviously where I live, it's just sure. prime hiking world. But at that time when I started photography, actually, I used to be, I used to be such a different person, which we will get into with the yellow dress now, but I actually was really overweight. So I was around about 250 pounds, which in the kilo world, I'm probably wrong on this, but I think it's about 95 kilos. And it'd pro probably be close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, because I started photography, especially landscape photography, that meant I had to get out and start exercising and getting to the places I wanted to photograph. So it actually changed my whole lifestyle. And I start, I lost a bunch of weight with that because I started being in, invested in the landscapes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. What's your approach to photography as it relates to 
your art. What is obviously your style has developed and changed from where you started 12 or 13 years ago to where you are now. How has that started to take form for you in in terms of how it's a creative expression as opposed to, as I said, just recording stuff? So I definitely consider myself in the genre of fine art and lots of people will have a definition of what fine art is, but I Who knows Googled what it. it really is. I, I know. I Googled <laughs> it one day and then I liked the definition and I was like, yeah, that sounds like me. What I like read about it is the fine art is like taking an idea and then creating, executing it. Yeah. Like you're not just going out in the landscape and this is why the self-portraits are so important. But yeah, so you, I try to get involved with like storytelling and just, yeah, creating that all around idea. So I consider myself a, a what I call you myself a fine artist. No, that doesn't make sense. Why I'm not? in Photographer. fine art. <laughs> I'm a fine art. Yeah. Fine art photographer. So I, but I do believe when I started photography, it was based around creativity and art. I just didn't know it back then because I was so young. Sure. sure. I loved it, looking at conceptual work and especially deviant art was a huge influencing factor on that. Like mm-hmm. I loved when people would photograph self portraits and they were based on an idea, like a conceptual idea. And I loved like levitating images. And I have this huge portfolio of the images like that, but I don't do it anymore, but because I've evolved, but yeah, a fine art photographer. Sounds good. So you classify yourself as a photographer rather than an artist or an artist rather than a photographer? Right now, um, well, you don't I think, think it matters. It, I don't think it really matters. Yeah, I don't really think it matters. It honestly depends who I'm talking to. <laughs> some people will relate more to a photographer and some people will relate more to an artist. But looking down the road and down the future, I will be, I believe I'm an artist. Mm, cool, cool. So talk us through how the yellow dress concept evolved and how that got started. How old, I've got to ask, how old is the yellow dress and how many miles they, do you think it's done? Uh, the yellow dress is still a baby, but it's still a baby, but also it's not. Maybe it's more like the toddler, <laughs> it's a <like> toddler <laughs> age. So the yellow dress has a huge backstory to it. And I'm like throughout my photography career journey, I've been known as a landscape photographer. So yeah. I've built up like this big portfolio and just my skill and became like a master in that. So I consider the landscape photography like the bread to what the self-portraits are and the self-portraits are the meat. But it actually started in 2019. And believe it or not, before the yellow dress, I did every color of dress you could think of. Like I started the thing that when I started in 2019, I my idea was to photograph different colors based on how they match the landscape. I really love doing that, like white Mm -hmm. fits here or blue fits here. So it started that way for a couple of years. And then finally, I got the yellow dress. I should back up and say this bit as well. I used to be a, like a wedding photographer, maternity photographer. I did sure, all sure. of those like portrait services. And with maternity and like weddings, you're often working with big, beautiful flowing gowns. So I would actually just use the client dresses that I had accumulated. And then I would start photographing myself in them. I had this one day. I used to live along a lake in Canada and I was like a sunset and sunrise warrior. I was always going out and creating landscapes. And this one night I went out to create for sunset, just a typical landscape, but I was really bored of it. So I was like, I wonder what it would look like if I put a person in the lake and did like a long exposure. And I just thought of it so quickly that I didn't have time or even the energy to gather up a model and get, get her out there and do that. So I was like, why don't I just use myself? I can fit into these dresses and uh, I have really long dark hair. So I knew that it would look really good. So I went out one evening, it was quite stormy and I walked in the lake and I took my very first self portrait, which was actually a white dress. And then again, started photographing all the multicolored dresses, but I ended up getting a yellow dress. I didn't purposely do this. I didn't think I would use it, but I got a yellow dress because it was actually quite trendy at the time for clients. Yep. So I was like, okay, I'll add yellow into the fleet. And then I just noticed I was gravitating to it more and more for myself. And I noticed the response from like my audience was like, oh, you really sure like yellow. You sure are using yellow. But there's more to this story because it actually follows my life journey as well and things that had happened in my life and I believe 
that the yellow dress was very serendipitous. It just was meant to come to me at that time. Because when I started my self-portrait journey in 2019, that's when, right before COVID, so obviously loss of work, but I also went through like a divorce and yep. pretty much lost my whole life that I had built up with my husband and based around actually a lot of my mistakes that I did. So the person that I was quite different before <laughs> to now, of course, yeah, I've done yeah. a lot of changing. So the yellow dress actually represents like my personal growth journey, my self-awareness and becoming a different person. And yellow is so happy and positive and just such a bright color. And like what it represents is basically what I want to become. Mm. I'm a big believer. If you act like sunshine, you will feel like sunshine. Absolutely. And yeah. that's the yellow dress to me. And I like a lot of there's a lot more to the story of like how I grew up as well. And I didn't really grow up with a very healthy home. So there's a lot okay. of abuse that obviously influenced my decisions as an adult and where I made all my mistakes. So the yellow dress really is all about discovery and self-awareness and changing. Yeah, Fantastic. Are you using that as a means or a trigger for some of your creative expression in terms of how you've developed that self-portrait of a, a person in the landscape? And I, I know from many of your images, you can be quite small showing the scale of the, the grander yeah. landscapes, but sometimes it's a little bit more intimate where you're focusing on a smaller scene. Yeah. I, I guess, how is it developed in terms of using that element creatively? So for me, like there still is, I feel like it's almost in creating in two worlds. There's this part of me that I love the skill that I've built up and I just love the technical aspect of landscape photography and going out and creating and using all, everything that I've learned in my knowledge and then creating some great work. And then with the self-portraits, it's actually now taught me more how to story tell. So mm. I still, like when I go out and set up a scene and put myself in there, like I'm using my brain that is, this will look good. I know this will look good. And it started off with being like really small in the landscape scene. But now, because I do have portrait skill like built up from before, now I'm starting to get more intimate on placing myself in the scene, more close up. So maybe you can see some expression or like posing is really challenging. So I'm actually still learning a lot about posing, Yeah. but yeah. it's been, but like how my self-portraits are influenced is it's heavily based around my landscape photography skill. Mm, mm, cool. In terms of the process of experimentation, how long has it taken for you to not necessarily hone, obviously the landscape and the portrait skill sets have fed into where you've got to, but how much has it taken in terms of experimentation to get the shot? Because failure is something that everyone, particularly landscape photographers, know yeah. a lot about. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, and the number of shots that I've just fluffed because I've missed a setting or I haven't I've left the settings on from an astro shoot in a in a dawn shoot in some shooting at ISO 7000 oh, yeah. or whatever. <laughs> yep, I still do that. I, I do that all the time. I never I will always make mistakes. I think it's taken I don't think that part ever ends, so I consider I'm 13 years in deep of just still building up skill. And I know in the next 13 years, I'm only going to get better and better. I don't believe that part ever stops. But you obviously reach a certain level of skill where it's your work becomes really noticeable and recognizable, sure. but it will continue sure. to evolve and change. And it'll also be interesting to see how like the yellow dress evolves and changes as well. Mm -hmm. In terms of the concepts, are you planning them days, months, weeks ahead, or is it something that's a little bit more spontaneous? Because obviously um, those yeah. those set pieces have to be planned. You've got to you've got to work out where you're going to put the camera and the tripod. You've got to work out where you're going to position yourself in the shot. So it's not like yes. you can just turn up on on the day or the night and go, all right, tripod here. I'm going to stand there. Bang, off we go. It's actually a bit of both. And the spontaneous part is actually winning. So a lot of the okay. best work, a lot of like my best works has been created 
just showing up somewhere, not knowing what I'm doing, what the heck I'm photographing, what the weather conditions are. And it's really interesting how that happens, actually. That's the part I love the most is when I don't think I'm going to get something and then I create something that is like my best work. Mm. But there still is there. I still do a lot of planning and like visioning because I'm also into storytelling. So with storytelling, you have to think about it and like thinking in a conceptual way. So there's an element of planning, but there is also this big portion of me. And I think that's just because of the person I am. I'm incredibly impulsive, very spontaneous. People can ask me, hey, do you want to come to Italy next week? And I'll be like, yep, book a plane ticket and go. And then my mind will start spinning and I'll be like, okay, what am I going to create there? And then I start visioning things. I start researching like what other people have done and getting like an idea of what I'm going to do. But most of my work has been on the fly and created just really unexpectedly. Those are always my favorite. Mm -hmm. What does success look like for you in terms of either an image or a a body of work? Oh, that's as long as I feel really good about it and like my spirits are high after and I'm feeling that but like that adrenaline and that buzz, no matter how the audience responds to it, as long as I'm feeling good about it, I feel successful. Mm -hmm. And I especially feel successful if I've been like down and feeling like I'm in a creative slump and then I go out and create something that I think is great. That's success to me. Fantastic. Yeah. You mentioned storytelling and the desire to communicate. How much of your success do you attribute to that ability to communicate and tell a story in in your work? The last, I would say it's been now about the last, like two years, well, year and a half to two years of the yellow dress saga. And that has been the most successful that I have been not exactly financially successful, but becoming more globally known successful because I'm a big believer in purpose and a lot like, photography is hard photography is hard to make it as for a living out of it it's hard to grow a following it's hard to just grow it in general and because of my like self-development journey and like a lot of therapy and stuff I started learning about purpose and passion and again the yellow dress just ties in so much to purpose for me that I believe I'm supposed to be creating with the yellow dress so that I can share my story with the world it's become Mm. like the outlet of connecting with people especially on an emotional level yeah i guess harking back to the landscape work rather than focusing just on the yellow dress because your portfolio is much wider than that obviously yes my portfolio Um, is huge (laughs) how how about your uh success in communicating stories in those landscapes with just the landscape photography so as a business like I teach landscape photography and I work like I would work with brands and all of that stuff it's really hard to connect with people via landscape photography Mm -hmm. I find that very challenging but with the storytelling with landscape photography what I've been learning is it's really interesting you don't show up to the scene to photograph the scene like you make the image about the subject that you're photographing in the landscape. So as long as you're thinking in that way, you can communicate like a story behind the landscape. Let's say it's a big, massive mountain and it's stormy and moody, like focus on telling the story about that mountain in the mood. And with again, with landscape photography, I think it's harder to tell stories than if you put a person in the scene, taking like multiple images of that scene and tying them all together and sharing them all yeah all together at once really helps tell the story of that scene Mm -hmm. so if it's stormy when you show up to a landscape focus on conveying in the images that it's stormy and you will tell a little bit of a story through it yeah yeah okay in terms of the environment being a big part of your work how much do you push any kind of environmental advocacy with your work and whether that's the yellow dress or the or the the pure landscape work uh, do you think about things in those terms you the sense I get from your work is that it's very much grounded in the place and whether that's as you said it could be Italy it could be Scotland it could be Canada it could be Australia but there, there's very much a grounding in that environment and you very much get the feeling of being in that environment. How well, does it... I... Go on. Sorry. <laughs> I don't really focus on like at all, really talking about the environment. I just never think of it because 
I'm trying to share a different message through my work. I'm not, of course, I respect the environment and I know that I have influence and that I could definitely be sharing to people, hey, obviously leave no trace, take care of this. But I rarely talk about it. And that's because I'm focused on a completely different message. I'm mm. not focused, I'm not focused on the environment when I'm out there. But I do recognize like my responsibility and my influence. Again, I have been, there will be photographers that will, they're very gentle about it because I photograph a lot of wildflowers and some of them will just gently remind me if you're going to be, there's places where you can go in the wildflowers. There's obviously places that you can't and they will point it out, be like, maybe you should explain how you've been in this scene. A good example of this is every year I go and photograph a tulip festival, but I missed it this year because I was traveling too much. But I always go and photograph a tulip festival, which is controlled and put on. You pay for it. And they always have areas, they're pretty relaxed about their tulip fields. You can walk, they have one fields where you can go and pick flowers and they have ones where they, you can go and stand in the rows and take pictures of yourself. And I had one photographer, he was quite, came hard, down hard on me and was like, you should know better consider your influence. But I also felt you should know better because this is allowed to do your yeah. research and look You're at the tulip. trampling over yeah. some farmers. No, yeah. I'm not. And go and look at, I'm tagging the tulip festival in all of my images. And if yeah. you go and look at their account, they're sharing tons of images with people in the fields. They built those fields for things like that. And I don't believe people actually realize that the tulips that come up, like the colorful flowers that come up, that's for display. The uh, money-making portion and the environmental portion is actually the bulbs underneath the ground. Yep. So a truck, at the end of every season, a tractor will come over the tulips and cut off all their heads. Yeah, yeah they, It's such, such a special thing, the tulip festivals, and it draws families and people come in there and take photos. It's beautiful. So mm -hmm. I will stand up for things like that if, if someone is coming down on me for being in the flowers. Yeah, no, fair enough. I know over here we have canola season, and oh, which yeah. is where you get those beautiful carpets of yellow and green across farmers' fields. And I do know some photographers that are very res respectful of those yeah. fields because they're a financial crop for the yeah. fellow that, or the family that's growing them or the company that's growing them. Yeah, absolutely. A, I haven't been a... in a canola field yet. I definitely want to, but I do know because I live in an area where we have the same thing, the canola fields and the big farms, mm. and I drive past them all the time. And I have photographed them before, but if I was going to go stand in it at the edge of the fields, it's always a really sparse kind of, you know, yeah. it's like the, well, that, the dead of it. For me, that's always yeah. acceptable. Is the, Yeah, it, that's the place to stand. Also, if there's a barbed wire fence in front of me, I, I'm not climbing over it because I don't yeah. have to rip clothing. But yeah, me either. The, it's there for a reason. Use a longer yes. lens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, use a longer lens. I Actually, I shouldn't say I haven't been in a canola field. I have, but it's always at the edge of it on the side of the road where it's just the little fingers that trickle yeah, off. Yeah. And But I also know, because I grew up near farm world, I know that there's that that's their crops. I've had farmers drive by me before when I've been out photographing their fields. Not once have they ever come out and been like, what are you doing? If I, and if I get permit, like if I have asked before, if they stop and I'm like, oh, I'm just, I love your field. And can I photograph it? Oh yeah, of course. That's so good. But I would yeah. never go like way deep into a field because it's also mucky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't want to get dirty. <laughs> I don't feel like with fields and because the hordes of people will always gravitate to what's popular and yeah. being out in the middle of the nowhere in a farmer's field just doesn't do it for a lot of people. Yeah. No, that's the, so that's the great thing about it is we still have that special pocket to us to photograph, which is really quiet still. Yeah. It amazes me. I, I don't know if you've noticed it in Scotland and the UK, the right of way laws oh, yeah. that are there where literally I went on a, hike in the Lake District a year or so ago and to get to this particular waterfall you literally had to walk through this farmer's yard not his fields you you there was a lane up to the yard and then he's got his house and he's got his barns and he's got his tractors and whatever and he's chickens running around and you're walking through and all of these yep. hikers are just walking through that place and it's gone I don't know over here that you don't have the same laws so it yeah. just feels really weird and a little it bit does, yes. trespassy but <laughs> yeah I think it's called because they did it's the same in Scotland I learned that in Scotland yeah. when I was over there it's, it's called the right to roam mm. 
Yeah. You're allowed to like, I didn't know that, but I still didn't do it. And I felt, I would feel guilty. Like, I don't know, walking by someone's house at sunset. Hi, <laughs> I'm going to <laughs> photograph your yard, but it's, it's cool that you can do that. But yeah. I don't feel comfortable doing that. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I don't feel comfortable. I, I don't mind doing that where there's definitely a path. And if the path, yeah. in this case, the, all of the guides that I read said, this is where you go and the path is through there and the farmer yeah. just nodded and waved and that that was it it was uh -huh. it was cool by him if it's cool by the farmer i'm okay with it <laughs> we had when i was recently in scotland we did have this one moment where i felt like we shouldn't have been in the spot and it was like we just got stuck in our camper van and it was because we were on grass that was just way too soft and for me i didn't i was not driving i did not make this decision <laughs> i knew we were going to get stuck mistakes are mistakes it happened but i had a moment ba based on like where i am in canada we are very pro protect the environment and it's really controlled mm. i felt guilty that we were trying to put put the camper van on that patch of grass i don't i won't fully use the right to roam in these countries i will still respect it fair enough I guess one of the things I'm interested in is how you challenge yourself to come up with new ideas and think outside the square and experiment. What techniques do you use to do that experimentation? Oh, that's an interesting question. I don't, I never have a problem with this. This is never something that like I've ever struggled. Like I definitely get in creative funks, Everybody but I does. like, yeah. yeah, I push myself after, cause there's always a creative surge after a creative funk. So I always push myself, but I draw a little, I draw a lot of inspiration. Like I look online obviously and see things and I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. I'm going to go out and try that or learn this technique but I draw the most inspiration from like how I'm feeling in my heart, like at the time of my life, actually, that heavily influences my work. Yeah. And it seems to be, which is annoying. And I thought about this the other day, like if I have a lot of turmoil going on in my life or like a season where it's just not very good, I actually create my best work. And I'm like, okay, so to be a successful artist, I'm going to have to go through a lot of crap. Lovely. <laughs> Because that's usually when I create the best is when I'm really yeah, like, I, sad or I, emotional. I was, was talking to uh, TJ Thorne recently and he was saying almost exactly the same thing is that you don't get your best work by doing something that you're comfortable with. Yeah, because exactly. it becomes automatic. You, you don't push, you're not pushing yourself. So if you're not actually getting outside your comfort zone, how are you ever going to succeed and, and progress? Exactly. And I'm not a person I've never, like, well, I used to have a problem with being in my comfort zone, but not anymore because my life was flipped upside down. So I changed. Mm. So every aspect of my life is like living outside of my comfort zone. Like right now I'm just traveling Europe and just going with the flow and seeing what happens and creating on the fly. So I'm a big believer on getting out of your comfort zone and saying yes, saying yes yeah. to things. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I want to move on to the commercial, I guess, the the, the bits that <laughs> enable you to go and do things like that. So where did the commercial side of photography start for you? Was it with the portraits and wedding photography and then you've just expanded that into full-time landscape? Yes. So it started, I've always been a landscape photographer, so there's always been an element of that that mm -hmm. I've been like paid for. I just... I never understood business for a really long time. So that took a while to get a grasp on it, but financially and like actually making a dent in my wallet or like filling it up with money from photography started with weddings, families, portraits and all that. Sure. And then that was lost in 2020. So obviously at that, when I was ready to let it go as well, but at that point in time, and that's when the yellow dress was just taking off. I had obviously learned a lot and started to gain financially and in terms of the landscape photography, I'm more where I make an income off of that is like I work with brands. And yep. of course, there's an element of influencing with my work. A lot of people think I am a full on influencer, the typical Instagram. I'm not really actually <laughs> like I do some influencing, but not at the scale that people think that I do. And YouTube is obviously one of those commercial ones and NFT art, because that's quite new. That became mm -hmm. a, cause I got into it last year. So that 
became actually a big source of the income, but it's all down right now. So it's yeah. not a good year. <laughs> Last year was really great in terms of stuff like that. Oh, I also lead tours. That's a big one as well. And I partner with other photographers and we do about four to five tours a year. So that's a, yeah, that's landscape photography though. But I do bring the yellow dress into it as well. And I let the clients photograph the yellow dress. How do you handle being everything in an organization? So in a company, you've got a CEO, you've got a marketing director, you've got people under them that do things. You've got a finance and accounting team, usually. You've got a bunch of people that do operations and the website and all of those sorts of things. And maybe I find even, it all really hard. <laughs> yeah. So how does that fit in, into the business? It's also all of those things. It's such a learning process, I think. And I have definitely have gotten the grasp of it in the last year and this year. I did outsource at one point for an, an assistant more to, because yeah. the part that I find is the most challenging is actually, and because it's important to keep up with your socials. I find the social media part to be the most challenging. You just always yeah, have to yeah. constantly be on. And so I did hire someone, an assistant to help take, help me with that. But I take breaks here and there with using her because like, she's just not there yet. Like she's brand new to what she's doing. So I I need more of a skill within that. So I take it all on, but I'm a big believer that especially in business, like your first few years, you sacrifice a lot of stuff. If -hmm. you want to go, if you want to go great lengths and I have some major goals you put in hard. It's very similar to any kind of job that you choose. There's an element of sacrifice to become a master at it. Yep. Same with if you have kids, you sacrifice a lot of your life to go to those kids. Absolutely. And in my case, I sacrifice having a family and having kids and having a partner to build what I'm building. Okay. Do you find that challenge of keeping things going overwhelming at times and if you do how do you push through yes I find it very overwhelming because I also want to live my life <laughs> of course everyone I, like that yeah you want, like to, I also, you want to actually enjoy the experience <laughs> yeah exactly I like right now because since I'm traveling so much it, it there's definitely a portion that I'm giving away of my business to being able to get out and explore but I also can work on the road. So it's actually pretty, Mm. pretty handy. I'm trying to create a work life that fits around my lifestyle and I will, I'm definitely getting there, but I, I think that the thing that I sacrifice the most to keep this going and where I get overwhelmed is I'm 36 years old and I don't have a partner. I'm alone. I don't have kids. I don't have a home. I have a home base. I have a little tiny suite, but I don't have a house. I don't, I don't own any of those, but we could consider adult things and probably my dating life suffers the most, I would think. (laughs) Fair enough. I'm not going to delve into that. (laughs) (laughs) You mentioned the, uh, the goals that you've got. How important is it both for your creativity, but also for the business? How important is it to have those goals and be able to not necessarily just tick them off, but get to them, then work out, okay, what's the next goal? I think the goals are really important. Like what I've just learned, and this would be in any business, you don't have a vision for yourself and you don't have a plan for yourself. Plans include goals. Um, You'll probably lose steam and you'll you'll lose interest in it Mm. and you'll fall off the wagon. So I think really keeping your vision on those goals, but also being adaptable is really important to the success of your business. Definitely, definitely. And create creativity as well. You need to know that you need to get better at what you're doing. Yeah, I even find it down to individual images. I I need to have an idea in my mind what an image is what yeah. kind of image I'm trying to convey. And that starts in the field. And sometimes if it's a, an astro image, for example, it might even start with the planning u- using photo pills and Google Maps and yeah. all the other tools to work out, okay, that's where I need to stand and I can work a composition yes. from there. Yes, yes. They say with a YouTube, because YouTube's an interesting beast all on mm. its own. Um, that. <laughs> yeah, I remember someone told me because like I was encouraged to to get on YouTube and by like really great photographers. Nigel Danson was the one who like approached me and just said, you should be on YouTube. You would really fit it. 
And then I remember talking to, I think I was talking to maybe possibly Adam Gibbs a little bit about starting up YouTube. And he said, yeah. just focus on a hundred videos and improve something with each video. Mm. So that was really great advice. And it makes you think like long-term as well. Yeah. Like you're just, it's just not going to happen right away. So that's been helpful with goals. Yeah, I, I think with anything, nothing comes without effort and nothing comes yeah. without the steps. Nobody gets to 100,000 YouTube followers or whatever in, in one day unless no. they have some incredibly viral piece of content. Video, yeah, you got to have, yeah. if you can. They, I, they're so rare and the amount of content, the amount of stuff that's being produced these days, it's almost impossible to get seen unless you actually yes. just build and build, regardless of which yeah. social media you're using. Yeah. Reverse engineering is very important with YouTube. So mm. if you pick a niche or whatever you are into, less landscape photographers, research that niche and what other people are doing and do reverse engineering on it yep. and see what worked. So there's an element of give and take when you're building something like I don't I, of course, I don't want to look at trendy titles of what people are putting on their videos, but I also know you need to. Yeah, you can't get, yeah. um, unfortunately with YouTube, you can't get away without having some kind of clickbait title or thumbnail there that says, yeah. hey, look at me. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning. What, what I've been learning with YouTube is like what performs the best in terms of what the thumbnail looks like is having a person and a camera in it. Yep. Yeah, that's been interesting. I just actually learned this recently and I'm like, why didn't I know this 50 videos ago? <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. In terms of your workshops, let's talk a little bit about how a workshop or a tour with Sarah Lindsay, what does that look like? What does a typical day on a workshop with you look like? <sighs> They're intense. So again, I usually partner with people. I've been very fortunate. I have, I've had a couple of fellows that I've worked with who already had something built up and then I'm lucky enough to be brought on to co-lead it. And I also now work with Luminar, okay, like this, yeah. the, that, that software. They do the, what's called Luminar Adventures now, but they last year they started up a camp mm -hmm. and they bring on 40. It's really great. And they brought me on as one of the masters and that was pretty cool. So they approached nice. me about that. But these tours are... So I think everybody has a definition of what a tour in a workshop is, but for our, when we run something, we consider a tour, like a workshop is very educational based. There'll be a lot of classroom time and you're learning sure, something. Sure. And then a photo, like the type of photo tours we do, especially me and this fella, his name is Josh Cripps. Me and him have done quite a few together. It's mm -hmm. more of a trip. It's an experience for the client. It's a trip. We're teach we are teaching them photography out in the field, but the focus is taking them to the locations. Yeah. And then we also add in extras because these clients pay a lot of money for these tours. That's the mark, just the market we're in. Like we add in like a wine tour or nice. really nice restaurants and just give them a whole experience because that's what they want. And they're typically mm. older, retired with a photography hobby, and they just want to have make new friends and come learn photography, but also enjoy whatever country we're in at the same time. Sure. But they're very draining. Like they're, for all of us, those tour leaders and the participants at the end, we're just like, we're dead, but we <laughs> did it. We all did it. So it's pretty go, go those sunrises and sunsets. Yeah. It's always revolved around those. Absolutely. Absolutely. How do you maintain your creative vision and your artistic integrity and balance that with the commercial or client demands in your photography because what you might like photographing might not be what sells and whether that's an NFT or whether it's a print or whatever, whatever medium it's going to be. And how do you balance what you like to do versus what actually is commercially successful? That's a great question. I think about this a lot. So if, if I'm doing commercial work, which I don't do as much commercial work as like I used to, because I'm very focused on building the yellow dress sure. brand. And for when I'm doing the yellow dress stuff, it is my 100% creative vision. But I've also basically become the brand. Like it's not just the yellow dress that's a brand, like Sarah is the brand. Yeah. So yeah. what goes, whatever I create goes and... I, how I like get around monetizing on that is just understanding the markets that I would fit in. So I fit in the art market and yep. 
in terms of NF, let's just say NFTs or prints, when I like I have financial goals with those as well, like what I want to be selling my work at. So it's really just actually understanding for me, I create whatever I want to create. And a lot of the people that might buy my work will, will say in the NFT world, they maybe they don't really care about it. That doesn't bother me whatsoever. They're, it's more about the transactional value that's taking place. So they're mm -hmm. actually more buying into you than yeah. actually buying your artwork. And in terms of the commercial work, like if I was doing commercial work for people, like I just worked with a camper van company in, in Scotland and there was obviously expectations on both sides and I fulfilled the expectations that they had, but I also obviously was able to create what I wanted to, but they were really great. Like with the creative freedom, like I made them a YouTube video and they didn't care what I put in it. They loved watching me go out and create the yellow dress stuff how I saw it so I don't actually really struggle with this but if I was doing commercial work for like hotels or like photographing hotels or I'm traveling or anything like that I would definitely I know what to give them and yeah. it doesn't bother it doesn't bother me at all to photograph yeah, it's, a, like, it's, it's easy. a little bit different when there's a client yeah. with a brief because yes you don't if you yeah. don't fit the brief they're not going to hire you again and no and that yeah. stuff doesn't end, end up on social media or anything like i yeah. i already know how to do it i know the skill just go out and photograph it dump it in a gallery and then they use it yeah so i don't struggle with that i know a lot of people will say if they're doing photography for a living then they'll lose their love for it but i don't feel that at all because mm. i'm realistic i'm like if you want to pay the bills you might have to go and photograph a few hotels and Absolutely. it's a really an it's an ego thing, but I'm also, and then while well, I'm doing stuff that I do want to pay the bills, but the main thing I want to pay the bills is the yellow dress that has to be based on my vision. Cause mm. again, I'm the brand. Mm. Mm. A lot of people have the really big question. How do you price your work? And when I say that, it's not about giving me the number or whatever. It's yeah. about, do you have a formula? that you use or do you just think of a number I have a formula now but I didn't before but that comes yeah. as you learn business sure. I really don't I really don't believe well that's but there's so many little different genres that this could apply to but let's just take nfts for example it's very yeah. similar to selling prints so it, this would apply to if you had a gallery and you were trying yeah. to sell prints you're likely not going to have a gallery though right away you're going to have to build up a name so I don't I really think a photographer can shoot themselves in the foot if they, let's say they pick up a camera in their first year, they go out and create some work and then they want to sell it. There's no way you will be able to sell, be selling for what the people who are very seasoned and are already selling at like this high price. It's just not going to happen. You yeah. have no value. You have no value to add to the world. Mm -hmm. No, it's not just about pretty pictures. You really, you got to build up to that. So definitely starting off at a lower price point. And for those people, so let's say in the NFT world, if you're new to it and you are starting off at a lower price point and let's just say you become very successful and a lot of people are putting their trust into you to become successful. Yep. Those people that that supported you earlier, early on are only winning in the end. They got in at the right. Sarah yeah. Lindsay they, early price point. They picked point. up a bargain. <laughs> they picked up a bargain before your value like exploded. So That's right. I think the formula is very gradual when you start out and to be realistic. There's just no way like, Let's use an example of photographer, Will Patino, very yep. successful landscape photographer. If I started photography just this year of landscape photography, I can't go and ask for the prices that he's asking. Yeah. You've yeah. got to build it up. And that's just business. That's just life. And there's nothing wrong with that. No, that's right. I think a lot of people, particularly my opinion of what I've seen in the NFT market in, in particular, a lot of people are a bit naive, I think, about the parallels that are in that market with the traditional art market. Yeah, because it's cool. Because <laughs> everyone talks up it being Web3 and the artist being in control and all the rest of that sort of thing. But the gatekeepers are no. still there on, on Absolutely. Both, in both markets. And Absolutely. those elements that you were just talking about is a, a beginner or somebody that's not known, doesn't have a name in, in the market, is not going to be able to sell their work for the same price as somebody that's blown yeah. up and 
has got that name. Yep. And it's all, of course, I think you're bang on about people being quite naive. But I also think the NFT space, when it started, since it was new and it was exciting and there was Oh, yeah. Hype, and, you know, you know it, it filled it, people's it a, heads with it, dreams. It was a goal rush and people yeah. get excited when there's a goal rush. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But then it also helps weed out the people that don't have the drive or the passion to stick with it. And it's yep. still very much growing, but it is, ex I, on my last tour, I was working with a lady that works for Google and we were talking about the NFT world. And she said, right now it's just extreme niche. So mm. we're still very early on in the NFT art world. And there are tons of, it's fascinating. It is a fascinating world. There are tons of traditional art collectors that are like we believe this is the future so they are coll yeah. now collecting into that and it's we're still in the early years we're still considered the pioneers of it and building it up the, the traditional big names like sotheby's and christie's and yeah so sotheby's and christie's it, you know i think and i think you got to use your common sense as well i hate it's so hard to you gotta you gotta let trust build up especially with other photographers like you, yeah. other photographers are always telling each other what to do so you really got to use your gut and take your time to understand the motive of that photographer. And if, if what they're saying feels wrong, it likely is wrong and not right for you. Yeah. So that's really important is building up trust. And it's, yeah, Sotheby's and Christie's. And if you can open up your mind and just see like what the traditional art world, how they are incorporating this NFT world, like why would they be doing that if they don't believe it has a future? Exactly. Yeah. They might have, might have smelled the gold and said, okay, yeah. well, there's a short term gain to be made and yeah. we'll dip in. And if it all falls over, no big deal. But I, 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 I agree with you. I think yeah. they, they've looked at it and said, there's probably a future here and it's probably yeah. not going to go away too quickly. It might be a bit rocky in the early days, but it's. Of course. Because it, it mirrors a, crypto. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. It's tied with crypto. I don't, crypto I don't think is... it's helped with some Ooh. of the the PFP and some of the the gamification projects, yeah. which fall over, get rugged, and all those sorts of things, where people are invested. Investment for me, and it's no different to Wall Street or the ASX. Yeah, or exactly. Whatever. That art is the exact same it's thing. Just, just and... a fancy form of betting. <laughs> Yep, exactly. And like people are betting on the artist's value going up. And I think where people are naive as well is that you also have to understand human psychology. So with business, mm -hmm. I think it's really important to learn that there, there will be collectors that will, we call them collectors. They will often talk a lot about, oh, we're here for the art. We just love the art. And it's, if you know how humans operate, any sort of relationship, even whether it's like a friendship, a romantic partnership, or there's money involved, there always needs to be transactional value. Someone is gaining something from someone. Absolutely. And to think that and to think that is not how the world works is very naive. So Absolutely. these collect like some of these collectors might pump up their name or pump up artists in the NFT space, but they're doing it for a reason. It's all about trust and understanding people's motives. Yeah. They, they want to make, they, they've invested early and they, yeah. they want to make a profit at the end of the day. Yes. There are collectors though. They're very few and far between. Um, I have one great collector. I just know I could always go to him and because his heart is so good. Mm. Um, but I took time to learn, like for us to get to know each other. And he truly, he's, he is so, the knowledge that he shares with everybody, he's such a successful man um, is that he's, of course, I'm here to make money, but he is passionate about photography he loves it so yeah, he yeah. gets great joy out of collecting but he's smart so he'll pass on something that he doesn't think is like worthy this time but that man I believe in because of how I grew up I didn't really have a proper upbringing I've had people come into my life through my photography journey that have been mentors and have planted like that seed of my mind and have helped me actually grow and learn all this stuff yeah Let's talk a little bit about where you've shot, where you like to shoot. What locations are still on your bucket list? You've been to mm. many of the big ones, but is there anywhere that you just haven't been that is, is still there burning away going, I've got to go there, I've got to go there? Yeah, probably every country in the world. <laughs> would be. Yeah, like that, right now. That's my list, but <laughs> yeah, that's my, well, that's like my, that's my dream. Um, of course, I'm realistic that it won't happen. For well, pre pre COVID, I, I was actually planning to do the uh, Silk Road uh, because it's 
you don't see a lot of people do that because it's hard. It's not a, it's not easy to actually do that. And you don't see a lot of photography from it. And that was one of the reasons why I was planning to do it. But then COVID yeah. hit and it was, yeah. Go, well, just push starting off the journey in China, that's probably not a great idea. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, you just got to push it back a little bit. There's a ton of places. So right now I'm obviously really in love with Europe and like I did Australia, I've done New Zealand, I've done North America. So my focus right now is on the European countries and I just love, oh my gosh, I just love it here so much. I love the yeah. old charming history, the buildings. So that's my focus right now is knocking off some countries around Europe. I really want to go to Rome, really want to go to Rome, not mm -hmm. to go see all those I will. I love seeing the really popular spots because they're sure, popular sure. for a reason. They're, they are beautiful, but I'd love to find some old streets and just create like a little yellow dress series of like street photography, but old and charming. Yeah. And another project that I want to undertake, but this would be a huge project. And I would just try and even think of how I could begin this is I would really love to, because of what the yellow dress represents, and I hope to help as best as I can like change anything in the world for the better that's pretty important to me so I would love to travel to different countries and photograph other women in the yellow dress and tell their story cool, cool. yeah I think that okay. would be pretty cool I would love that it would be very sad though I can already tell I know I'd see some sad things oh definitely yeah that's, yeah that would yeah. be hard yeah. what I guess is the furthest you've had to travel for a shot that you've Just, deliberately said, I'm going to go there for, for photography as my main hmm. purpose. There's always other motives of why I go to all the countries as well, because I love to like, just travel and see friends. The furthest I've ever gone just for the shot. I don't know. I, that's a hard question for me to answer because I'm so easygoing. And if I know I'm going to a country, I'm like, okay, I get obsessed with it. And then I go and create. But the furthest I have gone from my home in Canada is definitely Australia. Okay. Yeah. That is quite the journey over there. Yeah, it's a bit of a hike across the Pacific. I've done it several oh, times. Yes, both, both yeah. And also for pleasure. But Last year in, the last year near the, the end of the year, I traveled back and forth to Australia six times because I was, ah. that's where my, I had a partner that lived over there. So it's going back okay. to see him. So I created, yeah, I created a lot of stuff in Australia, which was really fun. I And New Zealand, obviously. Yeah, fantastic. I haven't done any of the Asian countries yet, so that's that'll probably be next after Europe. Cool, cool. Is there anywhere you've been that you say, I'd love to retire there? Yes. I know it's way too early for you. But no, <laughs> probably everywhere, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> I would love, I would, I've always, since I was a little girl, I always thought I would live in Europe. I would be, I, would, I love it here so much. Yeah. I just love the culture and like of the different little, I love London. So this is definitely a place I'm, but I guess it depends what happens with the rest of my life. Like I'm just so open to whatever comes into my life, comes into my life. If yeah. I end up living in Croatia, I end up living in Croatia. Great. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I love Canada too. So it's like, that's my home. And yeah, I'm born and raised in the forests of Canada. So I mm -hmm. always want to have something there. I, I think I'd be pretty happy retiring in Banff. I've been there uh, a, a couple of times and yeah, yeah. That, that'd be a good spot to retire, I reckon. Yes. There I want to buy it. I do want to, I live, I actually live in Canmore, but I just okay. say Banff because it's easier for people to understand. But yeah, yeah, we're, we're uh, I do have Banff. a goal. I have a goal of owning like a condo or something in Canmore, but we are way far from that goal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what's your most memorable experience in photography? Wow. Probably when the yellow dress started mm -hmm. and the first country that the yellow dress went to was New Zealand. So that trip, I did a two week trip in New Zealand. It was not based on photography though. It just, I'm sorry, it was based on photography, but there was nothing that like, I wasn't working for clients. I was just creating fully for myself and I was with the right person and sure. we had the most beautiful trip of probably my life. And it really kick-started my love for travel and taking the yellow dress places. So that, I'd say that was the most memorable moment for me in photography. Fantastic. What about horror stories? Everyone has a, a, a trip or a, a, an event that 
has changed their life? Have you had any? Yeah, any... I've had. Yeah, I've had some horror stories. And again, like my photography journey mirrors my personal life journey so closely. So I can't ever really separate the two. But I think I had one. I had a nightmare story in Australia, and I had a nightmare story in Mexico. Like I had went to meet up with a friend in Mexico, and that was going to be on my list of creating as well. Mm -hmm. So I love to take the yellow dress to all the different countries and. Just the person that I was with was just very, uh, he just wasn't kind. And okay. I actually ended up one night, I was only there for three days. And on the last night of my third night, I just looked at him. I'm like, I'm booking a plane ticket. I'm going. Wow. So I, yeah. And I didn't end up creating any content there. I didn't do anything. No yellow dress image. And I like came back home to Canada and made a kind of a little bit of a YouTube video based around the reality of travel and photography. And it doesn't always work out. Wasn't a horror story, but it was just a pain in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> what have you learned about the world through photography? Oh man, oh that is beautiful. Like the world is gorgeous, and so that I hold very near and dear to my heart. Like the world is a beautiful place to photograph. But I've actually learned also the opposite about humans: that the world is actually quite ugly. Mm -hmm. And that's why the yellow dress has the purpose it does is because it just breaks my heart, like the way people treat each other and it's everywhere. It's all over the world, especially in like the vast difference of North America to other places that don't have anything. And like just seeing how children live. And yeah, yeah. so yeah, photography has opened me up to that. Again, it goes along with my personal development journey of just trying to be a much better person to the world. But I think the world is really ugly. It's beautiful and it looks like but the heart of the world is selfish and yeah I, I think people are the problem personally but uh, people yeah people just they're me. just <laughs> the world looks beautiful and the people are ugly yeah. and I don't want I don't want to be that and mm. I know how I grew up and I know how it affected my life and just made living quite difficult so I refuse to add to that I want to have the opposite effect so that's the goal with the yellow dress is hopefully to help inspire or change anything that I can. Yeah, fair enough. Do you prefer shooting alone or with other people? It really depends. Depends on what I'm focused on. If I need to work and create, especially for YouTube, I have like certain people that I can be around that come out with me. It's usually yep. other YouTubers because we just respect each other's space. We both go out and if we need to help each other, we help each other. Yeah. But I have a, I, if other people want to come shoot with me that is totally fine but if I'm doing anything for like YouTube I I, I need to be on my own yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. do you get your shot take it home get it into the computer start editing straight away or are you the type that leaves it for a little while and lets it gestate or <laughs> um... I'm a bit of both <laughs> If I'm really excited about it, and especially if it's for YouTube, I'll have to get to it right away. But a lot of the, it's actually mostly my landscape work that sits. I'm still, I was just doing a tour in New Zealand and I have so much to edit from that still. Yeah, yeah I'll definitely let things sit, but I don't create as much as I used to, which is interesting because I shoot now with more intention and story planning. And it's just not, I'm not like the spray and pray shooter anymore. So I don't have a huge backlog of images, but yeah, if it's important and it needs to go on YouTube the next week, then I get to it right away. Yep, yep. <laughs> and if I'm excited about it, if I'm excited about it, I'm like, yes, I need to edit this. Right into it. Yeah. 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 What is what does processing look like for you? Is it a you said you started out with Photoshop? I'm just interested. I don't want all the secret sauce or anything yeah. like that. But are you spending a minimal amount of time per image or anything up to an hour or two hours or sometimes yeah. days I know some people yeah, take, not days take, take a long time no. to edit you know? <laughs> no I can't spend days on them I used to edit a lot more than what I do now because I started out that way so I really loved the process of photoshop and sure. uh, putting things together but now I think wedding photography actually shifted that a lot for me because you have to edit so much at once that you become quite quick and I'm a big believer in getting it yeah, right in the camera your, as well you get your workflow nailed and you yeah, yeah. yes so I don't like, I'm a pretty simple editor now, actually. Like I'm very focused on getting it right in camera, but there are still some that you, I do need to spend a, quite a bit of time with because I know I can transform them into something that's great if I spend the time doing it. 
Mm. But I actually, I put out an editing tutorial recently and it was based on my quick workflow of you can create drama in a matter of 20 minutes. And it's very simple. There's no luminosity masking, nothing like that. It's just really simple techniques that I've built up over time so that I can quickly get out images. Yeah, fantastic. You mentioned that you've received a lot of support and help from some other photographers and YouTubers, and you, you've mentioned a couple like Nigel and, and Adam. How important do you see that collaborative approach and that community building and fostering younger artists? How important do you see that to being, I guess, a player in the industry? So important. I think it's actually one of the most important things. And my last video I I put out was like, if I could start photography from zero, this is what I would do. And mm. there was three key points that I touched on. And one of them was engaging and building a community. Yep. So when you're starting out, like it's just so important in the early stages to be getting involved with places because that will help you grow. And I didn't do this to start with. Like I used to be very private and quiet and just loved creating for myself. So now I'm playing like the last few years, playing a lot of catch up of building up a little community. But I think it's really important. You have building a community will translate into business. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so that's it's so important. But even the fact that there's a I will see a lot of people. Okay, if I so in my position now, like when Nigel reached out to me, this was many years ago, and he basically said, get on YouTube, give me the push. There was no reason he had to do that. And yeah. he just did it because he saw it. He saw it in me. So I, I can now I can see myself doing that. So I'm like, see my friends who are just like baby photographers. Don't this just a hobby for them. If mm -hmm. I see something that they do on social media that really jumps out at me, I am all over them like you don't understand I see your potential I see it I see it in you keep going with this keep going so because yeah. I feel the passion for them in my heart and I just want to make me go and I know how important encouragement is absolutely like a lot of people don't a lot of people don't have encouragement and especially when they're starting in the early on stages they don't have it so I try very hard to be that voice for people that's one of the reasons why I, I started this as many reasons why I started this podcast was that view of looking at people in the industry or well, even if they're not in the industry they're not selling or, or or whatever and one of the things that I'm really trying to do with this is be fairly diverse in my coverage I've got people like yourself that have got quite strong yeah. social media followings and uh, as I said at the beginning people should know your name but yeah. there's also people that have got like 100 followers that I've had on. Yeah. And yes. the, the thing is, I've recognized, that, as you said, in their work, there's something there and they need that. Well, they may not need that push. They may have yeah. the drive themselves. But for me, I, I think if I can give them a leg up and, or, or I can give them a, a, a push along, then uh, it, it's certainly going to help. Yeah, I agree. And but you're also helping by you're helping the younger, not younger, but baby photographers, I guess we'll call them. You're also helping them by get bringing on the big people. Yeah, absolutely. because yeah, that like that knowledge that you guys are adding is just so valuable to the people who want to learn and grow. Totally. So it's totally. yeah, it's incredible doing that. Yeah, the, the, you can get from somebody with a great deal of experience that's been in the game for a long time is uh, yeah. absolutely vital, I think, to yeah. help people grow their own careers if yes. it's the career they're looking for. Yes. Also, yes. be helpful if it's just a hobby. Yeah, absolutely. Because in some way, no matter when you're doing sharing your art to the world you want some sort of recognition we all do absolutely like yeah. it's imp whether it's whether that's that endorphin financial. hit when somebody says hey great job yeah yeah <laughs> whether it's just yeah to monetize or to just be recognized we all want it so the knowledge that we all share can be helpful for everything definitely definitely what do you see as the biggest challenge facing photographers right now oh this is a good one honestly there's a couple of things, lack of business knowledge mm. and not understanding if they want to make money off of it, not understanding what it truly takes to make it as a business and social media. I think social media is one of the biggest challenges because it's such a pain in the butt. We still need like an outlet. It's a love-hate thing, isn't it? <laughs> it's a love-hate. We still need an outlet to share our work and get recognized and grow and be able to do it as a living. But like the the, at the what the rate that the world is changing into short form video is very obvious and 
So we have to adapt and mm. you don't have to change. Like you don't have to become like, oh, the next dancer on TikTok, but you need to figure out how to use these platforms as a new business card. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's been, cha- that's challenging for me because I'm stubborn and I do short form video, but not, I'm not as dedicated to it as say like the long form YouTube content. Yeah, I'm very much the same. I much prefer these yeah. long conversations and yeah, the podcast form. One of the, yet another reason why I started was I was listening to some of the other landscape photography like Matt Payne and Nick Page and those guys, and they triggered off that inspiration to say, oh, I, I reckon I could do that. <laughs> yeah, so you're. I think you're actually in a smart position because especially with YouTube, podcasts are on the rise with YouTube. Very much. I noticed the other week they've actually now created a a new playlist sort of element, which is basically a podcast. So you can actually classify a playlist now as a podcast or create a completely new playlist as a podcast. Yeah. Um, So, So yeah, our podcasts are taking over. (laughs) Yep. That's good. That's good. What do you see the future of photography being? We're definitely going to be. In, in, in influenced by I guess AI so definitely yeah. that's quite the work yeah I guess we're gonna have to see what's gonna happen but I just it, no matter what changes and like how much AI takes over I do think that photography will still always have its niche and mm-hmm. there will always be people that love it and support it and just like a film like when we change from film to digital film is yeah. still around there's still yeah. people that are into film. It just might become even more extreme, like mm. extreme niche. Yeah. yeah, that's where I see the future. I don't see people that love the experience of getting out into the fields and doing landscape yeah. photography. I see yeah. definite threats for people doing commercial photography, less so yes. weddings because that's an event if you're not there. So I think yeah. some of those may actually gain a little bit of value. Yeah. But for the the modeling industry and for things like product photography i can definitely oh, yeah. see, you see know, the threat yes mar- marketers just typing away going okay <laughs> this can of whatever it is that the, yep. the soft drink is the, exactly that way i want a few more dew bubbles on it thank you very much and yeah what they want yep. people are soon going to be selling prompts rather than tutorials Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be, a, I know it's going to be. It'll open up new markets. It'll close down some yeah, of them. Yes. Yeah. That's why I think it's so important, but it'll never take away how commun- humans emotionally connect with each other. So that's why I think it's so important to, if you're comfortable with it, like in my case, I'm not afraid of video at all or talking to the camera. So this is my chance to connect with people and create that like emotional connection with them. So I see video being very valuable. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. If you weren't a photographer, what would you be? Wow. So many things. (laughs) I, my first choice would be a psychologist. I really am into that. And my second choice is a police officer. Wow. Okay. I know, but I'm too sensitive to be a police officer. Right, I would right. have such a hard time. I'm, I'm I almost definitely did on it. Twitter now saying Sarah's, Sarah wants to be a cop. <laughs> I almost quit. It was like maybe 2018 before I got divorced. I was like, I want to be a police officer because my brother went through the same journey mm. and he is a police officer now, but I just obviously wasn't like driven or passionate enough for it. And I really thought about it. I was like, there's no way that I could go up to car, car accident scenes and see dead people and <laughs> like yeah, yeah. children, see children abused. So I obviously am very passionate about what I do. So I'm sticking with it. Yeah. I have, I have a brother-in-law in the UK actually, who's recently retired as a police officer and some of the stories he's had and some of the stories he won't tell as well yeah uh, but I I know that he's been involved in through other sources yeah it's definitely not I I gotta admit I it was something that I considered as a career choice when I was at school yeah but, uh, it's an amazing again, career but... oh absolutely but again Oof, it came tough. down to is, is it something I'm passionate enough about to get into and yeah turned out I was much more passionate about computing and IT than I was about That's being a good. police officer <laughs> we all have our thing I'm quite passionate about like psychology I always I do therapy and I've been doing it for about four years and I just mm-hmm. love what I learned so if this ever did go down that's probably the I would go that way yeah, fantastic. Mm-hmm. 
are there any photographers that you think I should be talking to on the podcast? Mm, yeah, I think you should give Jenna Dixon. I've actually already oh, spoken to Jenna. Oh, okay, so she's, oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, no, actually, I remember that. Oh, my gosh, I should go back and listen to it. I remember when that <laughs> happened. Okay, she would be my choice. There's tons. I think David was the one who recommended me. Yep. I think Tim, Timbo Slice would be a good one. There's also this other fella, actually. He recently just quit his full-time job to become a photographer. Mm -hmm. And that might be, he might be a pretty interesting person to talk to because he's just fresh into the transition and it's just how he struggled and but he doesn't yeah. want to give up like he his name is james and james michael andrew photography james and then michael. also okay. yeah and then also tim timbo slice that's yeah his, i know like, tim yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah tim tim is so lovely no never mind scrap those guys sorry okay <laughs> <laughs> i just thought of someone because he's reset incred <laughs> yeah he's incredible his story is incredible it is rob robert downey in his therapy. intrepid photos intrepid yeah yeah i would do him because i've what... asked him i've asked him and he what did he said, say he said no a little while ago he wasn't in the right space but i might hit him up again that, that hit him up a, again yeah that was a year or so ago yeah. hit him up again because he's got a story well, what happened hit, yeah hit him up in dms and tell him to. Get... I, I will i'll message him and i'll be like just do it so you can go tell your story on the podcast that so yeah those are my recommendations oh, he does have a fantastic story i've seen his the... posts around that and he's yeah uh, it's heartbreaking getting hung out to hang out to dry in in the caribbean yeah. Yeah. yes yeah but those yeah those are my recommendations all right i've got one more question for you and for most of my listeners it's the most important one that i have do you like pineapple on pizza? Absolutely. I'm Canadian. <laughs> we invented it. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it called Hawaiian then? <laughs> I don't know. We must have been like, pineapple is very Hawaiian. Of course I do. That was my favorite pizza growing up as a kid. Hawaiian really? or okay. pineapple, ham and cheese. Yep. yep. That is a Canadian classic pizza and it's delicious. <laughs> fantastic <laughs> uh, it's been absolutely wonderful having you on the show sarah where can people find your work the best place is probably my website which is www.sarahlindsayphotography.com instagram twitter youtube youtube is the most definitely valuable YouTube. for everybody definitely youtube so i'm everywhere as sarah Lindsay. fantastic all right well thank you very much sarah thank you very much Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grindswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, Vero, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. If you're interested in buying prints or photography gear or doing a photo workshop with me, these are also on sale on my website. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon. Mm -hmm.